Whoa, hey, watch it, pal. Down here, biscuit boy. What? Is that a tone? Oh, come on, that was a perfectly normal shift. And I'm tired of you droning on about everything. You think you can talk to me like that? I think I can. It's about time I start standing up for myself. How inspirational. You ever heard of bankruptcy? The general consensus of the online car community is that continuously variable transmissions are evil. They're said to bully drivers with catastrophic problems while they drain every last ounce of fun from behind the wheel. Today, I want to talk about why they've earned that reputation and if you should really avoid them. CVTs have actually been around for over a century, and in the 50s, there were some Swedish cars that had mass-produced versions. In the US, the first real production model was offered with the Subaru Justy, but it really wasn't until the turn of the 21st century that we would get transmissions like the ones we know today. So in order to really understand why people don't like them, I think it's important to understand how they work. So you'll have a metal belt or chain that goes around two pulleys. One is centered around the input shaft, the other, the output. And it's the pulleys themselves that actually change their effective diameters. These pulleys have a cone shape and they have hydraulics behind them. They're called variators. The input and output shaft each have one. Now the chain is going to sit in between the cones on either side. In order to change the gear ratio, you need these cones to either squeeze together or spread apart. That's why those variators have hydraulics. They literally push the belt further up or let it slide further down and they have to work inversely. That chain's diameter does not change. So this is how a CVT is able to change to whatever ratio it sees as fit. From there, the power will go to a planetary gear set, which allows you to flip the direction, providing a reverse gear. To get the power to the axles, we have a final drive gear. And you also still have a torque converter to connect it to the engine and solenoids to make everything work. So what all goes wrong? Well, a few things. Briefly, I'd like to thank the kind people over at Royal on the East Side and Royal South Mazda in Bloomington, Indiana, for letting me drive a couple vehicles to make today's video possible. Royal is comprised of a knowledgeable staff and they are dedicated to the community. If you're in the market, check them out. Let's talk about the current heavyweight champ of transmission failure, Nissan, along with what seems to trouble them. So a lot of times the symptoms that people would experience would be something like a shuddering, which likely occurs because of the job of the variators. If there's an oil leak somewhere and it's not getting enough to the variator's hydraulics, it can cause some play in that chain, which could result in some shuddering or make it slip. A lot of times people are also advised not to change the oil, which is really dumb, not just because of the heat generated, but because the oil is what the variators use as hydraulic fluid and the metal belter chain uses the lubricant to glide up and down the metal cones. So especially if you do any sort of towing, you live in a hot environment, you're going through a lot of hills, that's all going to accelerate wear. So me personally, if I owned one, I would be changing that fluid every 50,000 miles. And with Nissan's inadequate cooling can also definitely be a problem. This design will accumulate some heat and that can certainly damage the internals there. So some other symptoms you might experience of a failing CVT would be something like a whining. It seems like they've been improving and I'm not seeing near as many reports, but of course time is gonna need to tell. I'd also like to talk about Subaru because they've also had to extend warranties to please customers. Though with Subarus, most of the failures were not what they seemed. People were actually having problems with the torque converter, but specifically the torque converter lockup solenoid, which would basically prevent the torque converter from locking up, which would also cause a lot of slipping. But in order to replace any solenoid on a Subaru transmission, you need to change the whole valve body, which can be done by the DIY type, yet the part alone can be a grand in some cases. But if you went to the dealer, a lot of times they would just replace the whole transmission, which really gave their CVT a bad rap. But their newer CVTs have been much better, it seems, at least when it comes to problems reported. Though they haven't been perfect, mainly because of the turbocharged models that also came with the CVT. Those had a problem with the PCM, the powertrain control module, which was addressed through a recall. So how can we make the CVT better? Well, for starters, I think Toyota's launch gear design is probably the best way to go about a traditional one. 
The logic is simple. Start off with a traditional gear and then shift over to a regular CVT for peak efficiency. So this would eliminate a nice amount of stress from the CVT. Toyota also makes an eCVT, which in this application, it actually shares essentially none of the designs that I just talked about. It works as a part of a hybrid system and utilizes a motor to change the gear ratio from the engine. And it also uses a planetary gear set to put the power to the ground. And the result is something that feels more natural than a standard CVT, while also being insanely efficient and very, very reliable. But I also think it's worth mentioning in this conversation that Honda and Toyota have made some really reliable regular CVTs. Even the Subarus with the solenoid problem, the transmissions themselves were actually fairly robust. For regular drivers who aren't concerned with having an exhilarating drive and you're buying a compact car or SUV, I think it's actually a, a great option. Here's why. It's smooth. When I want to get up to speed, it does exactly what I want it to. Sometimes it'll simulate gear changes, but it's always very smooth. And because it doesn't need to commit to any specific gear, any slight throttle increase will cause it to raise the RPM without fuss to help get you up hills or execute a pass at whatever pace you want. So a lot of cars with regular automatics can at times be a little too reluctant to downshift. And as they've been used more commonly over the decades, they've also gotten better at taking off. They don't lurch as much. They don't have as much of that rubber bandish feel, though there's still a limitation there. Again, those cones need to clamp down on the chain to change the ratio quickly when it's taking off. That's why you have that rubber band feel, or I guess why there's that disconnect that you especially feel at the low end. This is an engineering hurdle that's so difficult to fix that Toyota, again, just added a launch gear. Once you get going though, I mean, it's just so smooth. And for most people who are just commuting, this is nice. Even if the power doesn't instantaneously get transferred from your foot to the gas. And they also tend to be more efficient than standard automatics because they don't need to abide by select gear ratios. They can choose what's best for the amount of acceleration that you desire, and then it can choose whatever cruising ratio it thinks is best for that moment too. Though I do think it's worth noting, it's not truly infinite. There are an insane amount of gear ratios, but they're set within the parameters of a maximum and a minimum. For me, the reason why I don't see myself ever buying a car with a CVT is not because I think it's going to blow up and steal my lunch money. I trust them enough, I just think they're boring. I love driving and I love feeling like I'm a part of the process. You get that sensation the most if you have a manual transmission, of course, but even with a regular automatic like this CX-30, Having instantaneous direct connection to the gear is important to me. It feels like the car is just responding to my right foot versus the CVT, which kind of acts more like a buffer. So thankfully, in the world of reasonably priced and sized cars, we still do have some traditional automatics and even a few manual transmissions. Mazda offers a six-speed or now an eight-speed automatic in all of their mainstream cars. This to me just feels right, but I want to briefly compare the pros and cons to something like this with a traditional CVT. The CX-30, even though the tuning isn't bad by any means, and the takeoff is much better in my opinion compared to the Crosstrek, without the turbocharged engine, the limited gear ratios that you have to choose from here means that there's a gap in gearing. Even after you get it to downshift, sometimes it'll still take a moment for it to get to the ideal power band for the given situation. Whereas with the Crosstrek, it kind of just flows to whatever RPM it thinks it needs. For instance, my parents bought a two liter Crosstrek after test driving a CX-30 and thinking this engine felt more wheezy and regular driving when compared to the Subaru, despite the CX-30 actually coming with nearly 40 more ponies. However, I think the story changes if we start adding more power and torque. For example, you can get an Outback with the turbocharged engine. This has plenty of acceleration, it's very quick, but because the turbocharger has to spool up and the CVT needs to get situated, it takes away from the entertainment factor and it doesn't feel as refined as something like the Mazda CX-50 with the turbocharged engine. That one has so much passing power in the mid-range that having just six gears to work with isn't really much of a problem. The CVT also struggles to put the power down from a launch. In fact, next to the naturally aspirated model, it wasn't any faster at all at the takeoff. Once you hit about 20, then it begins to warp time. 
I think the XT is a great option to have for those who want excellent passing power or live at high elevation and have no plans to push it on winding roads. For spirited driving, having that uninterrupted connection to a gear is important, something Subaru acknowledged when they built the WRX CVT, which does a good job at mocking fixed gears. And while it shifts better than any other CVT I've driven, it's still not quite the same as a traditional gearbox. It's easy to rag on cars with CVTs for sounding like a burly moped. And with the questionable history of brands that rhyme with Dijon, the criticism is warranted to a degree. Many brands haven't had the issues that have been so common with others. The designs have been refined and improved too. They still have limitations, mainly with how much power and abuse they're willing to take, and the disconnected feel will keep them from being in the garage of most car fanatics. But when you're looking for something to go from A to B that's low on power and big on frugality, the CVT does a great job at working in the background, and with Hondas, Toyotas, and even Subarus, well, most of the time, they're trustworthy when you maintain them properly. Thanks for watching. I apologize for the lack of posts lately. I'm in the midst of filming a giant video series as I look for cars to replace my GR Corolla. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to catch the first episode soon and to see more fun, detailed car content without fluff. Consider becoming a member for an additional podcast and to help me take on larger projects. I'll catch you in the next one.